Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. The liberal politicians who support criminal aliens and they support them over, far over, American citizens, Nancy Pelosi and her gang. They've got to be voted out of office. They've got to be voted out of office. Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi has long been a boogeyman of the right. But even with a blue wave poised to break in November, some Democratic candidates are reviving what has become a time-honored tradition within part of the party, giving in to Republican bullying by throwing Pelosi under the bus. The Washington Post has found this week that so far, 10 Democratic candidates have said they would oppose Pelosi's return to the speakership, while at least another 10 have conspicuously declined to express support for her. Joining the panel now is Danielle Moody Mills, host of Woke AF on Sirius XM, and back with us, Sir Michael Singleton and Michelle Bernard. So, you know, Danielle, I uh, let me just first of all play this ad, and then I'll, I have a question for you on the other side. This is a new ad this week by somebody named uh, Todd Rokita. He's running in Indiana, Republican who's running for the United States Senate. And here is his ad. Mueller, Pelosi, Donnelly. They're using fake news to destroy our president. Who's tough enough to stop the witch hunt? So Joe Donnelly is the incumbent, so that makes sense to attack him. Mueller, of course, he's the villain who's going to get Trump, and everyone has to be Trumpy. But throwing Nancy Pelosi in has been a Republican staple since 2010. She's the boogeyman. She's the bad guy. That is, I get But why do you think Democrats then respond to that by saying, oh, God, no, no, we don't know her? Yeah, I don't understand what that is in which Democrats do that, because Nancy Pelosi, she's the first woman speaker. Right. She's the one that we should applaud for the Affordable Care Act and getting that through Congress. So I'm confused. I'm also confused when people start to bring up her age, as yeah. if we didn't have a conversation about Donald Trump's age or John McCain's age or any of the men that are still in leadership or run for president. Right. But when it comes to women, for some reason, it's like, oh, no, we need new, fresh blood. And I'm like, ho, 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 if we were to average the median age of Congress right now, it's like 103. <laughs> so why so why is it okay then that like we come for Nancy Pelosi about this? I think first of all, she's raised 16 million dollars yeah. in like the first quarter, right? Yeah. She is the Democrats money woman. She has the Cardi B money bag. They should be <laughs> they should be applauding her, not running from her. It's interesting Michelle because so typically when you think about a house speaker Usually it's a combination of seniority, somebody who's raised a lot of money, to Danielle's point, somebody who knows where all the bodies are buried and can cajole members to take unpopular votes that they don't want to take. That's all what Nancy Pelosi has done, right? Like she pushed her caucus to vote the Senate health bill when the House bill was a lot better, a lot more liberal. She really forced people to do it. And she's considered the most productive speaker since like Sam Rayburn, right? I think when you add up the amount of legislation. So one wonders what would be the pragmatic reason why you would want to have, you know, you get you on 
want younger leadership, but in the speaker's chair, you mean you want somebody less experienced, who's raised less money, and who's done less hard work, that somehow that would be better for the party. I'm not sure I understand that argument. Look, because the argument is absolutely insane. And to add on to, and to, add on to what you were saying, Joy, also remember that the Democratic Party gets almost half of its votes from people who are non-white. There is a gender gap in the country. The Democratic Party gets the majority of its votes from women. What are they thinking, particularly in the era of Me Too, Harvey Weinstein, all of the other atrocities that we have seen, and you look at Nancy Pelosi's effectiveness, it is as if the Democratic Party that says we are the party of diversity, we are the party of civil liberties, um, are, are wimping out and they're saying, well, we want to just go back to being the party of white males because then people will like us and they'll vote for us. The strategy is ridiculous. It's insane. They should celebrate diversity. They should celebrate Nancy Pelosi's successes. They should go after the women's vote. They should go after all of those white women who, for some reason, voted against their self-interest and voted for Donald Trump. Nancy Pelosi is the person to bring those women back to the Democratic fold. And it's interesting, you know, Sher Michael, because, you know, the Republican Party tried this experience, this experiment with going with the young gun, right? The person that's sort of attractive to the media because they're young, a young, you know, white guy named Paul Ryan. And he has not been effective as speaker, right? The, the, this idea that you get somebody who, who doesn't have, who hasn't been sort of trial, had gone through the trials by fire, it hasn't really worked for your party. Um, what has worked is creating this, I guarantee most Americans probably, if you showed them a picture, of Nancy Pelosi, it's hard to say how many would know who she is, but her name has become this sort of, you know, the villainy that's been attached to her. It's been very effective. I don't know what your, what your, your thoughts on that. Look, I mean, I think as it relates, Joy, to Paul Ryan, one, I mean, no one foresaw, the, you know, Donald presidency, right? None of us. Uh, number two, you have the Freedom Caucus. You have various factions within the House, which would make it almost impossible for any speaker uh, to lead effectively. Remember, that was part of the reason why John Boehner decided, you know what, screw this. I ha I've had enough. But look, as it relates to the Democratic Party, I've also critiqued my own party as it relates to this issue. Granted, I give Nancy Pelosi credit. I think she's done a great job for the Democratic Party. She has indeed raised a lot of money. Uh, but at some point, when are you grooming that next uh, group of leaders, right? And if you want to stick with a woman, can they not find a Hispanic woman? Can they not find an African-American woman? I say the same thing for my own party. When you talk about some of the issues uh, of diversity in, in our country, diversity in our political representation, where are those African-Americans, Hispanics, Asians, gay, uh, LGBTQ individuals? that these parties are grooming to lead their parties uh, into the next direction. I don't think you see that from either party. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend as if selecting Nancy Pelosi is a good thing as it relates to the direction of this country, just as my party also needs to do a better job of reflecting where the country is going. And I think, Daniel, that's objectively true. The Democratic Party needs to start bringing up younger leadership, leaders of color, more diverse leadership. That's absolutely true. But the speaker's job is a very specific job, right? And it requires, you want to talk about factions. The health care bill she had to bring together anti-abortion Democrats mm -hmm. who wanted stronger language on abortion with very liberal Democrats who were demanding a public option or they would not vote for the bill. The Democratic Party is more racially and ideologically diverse than the Republican Party. A younger leader, you know, Tim Ryan, could he have passed that bill? I mean, no, I, I don't think so. I think that Nancy Pelosi has the, the background, the historical knowledge, the know-how, and the grit to be able to grease things through Congress, which is exactly what you have to do. I don't think that a, a younger, inexperienced person, I don't think that that is the role for them. Now, I do believe, I do believe that Sherman Michael is correct in the fact that we do need diversity. We do need to see diversity in leadership. This was the problem coming out of the Obama administration, saying that, oh my God, Obama, charismatic amazing you know love him but where was the building of the pipeline over right. the eight years from the rest of the Dem Democratic Party there wasn't one yep. so we have stars absolutely we have stars and figures that are that are fantastic but at the end of the day we're not building the pipeline but that doesn't mean that then you just blow up the pipe and yeah. say we don't need Nancy Pelosi yeah. right because we do you need that innate understanding of how government works It is Friday, the 11th of May of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, once again, French 77 and uh, the Saint-Germain. 
uh, yes, the elderberry flower liqueur. That is the key. Simple syrup is fine. That would make it a uh, French 75. But uh, I think the most balanced cocktail in the world is the French 77. And uh, uh, just not my opinion. It's the opinion of others, too. Okay. And I might even venture into saying that uh, it's a fact because uh, I'm that certain. Yes. Try it. Do. Order it. Okay. Wow. Wow. Another another news day. And that news day happens to fall on a Friday, which means it's the weekend, which means everything will be uh, exposed once again over the weekend. And we'll have too much to talk about on, on Monday that uh, we'll be left with... Uh, uh, mostly because it's all been talked out over the weekend by the time we even get to Monday. Jeez, where did Trump get the cash when he was uh, the king of debt? Where where did he get the cash? All cash payments. I mean, every, <laughs> they have controls and banking regulations to make sure you're not laundering money in these all cash deals. Makes you wonder why he doesn't want you to see his taxes now, doesn't it? Because you always have one set of books for the government, you know, for the tax man. You got another set of uh, uh, books for the legitimate banks. And then you got the real books for the mobsters you're taking uh, the high interest loans from. Yes. Yes. So where did he get the cash? Uh, we're finding out, aren't we? Well, uh, looks like an Oregon school district bend. The bend Oregon school district are making LGBTQ kids uh, read the Bible as punishment. And I suppose that would be terrible punishment. I mean, especially the Bibles they read. If I was going to impose Bible reading as punishment, I'd make them read it in Latin and in high heels, dancing backwards. Okay. Uh, we'll show them how the LGBTQ kids can take their knocks. What what idiocy. Yeah, it's idiocy. And apparently um, uh, a counselor there in that district uh, has been harassed and uh, life-threatened for standing up to the kids against the superintendent and uh, uh, a principal and a few others that are have deemed it uh, necessary to impose their religious edicts upon the population because, well, there's a new sheriff in town, ain't it? I, I just so love it. A libertine like Trump elevated to the godlike status that the white evangelical sees as, well, the second coming of Christ, when I really think it's, uh, you know, how many comings of uh, Beelzebub? Every, every apocalypse movie, every movie about the rapture always shows the Antichrist as being um, relatively unnoticed. I mean, he would be a capitalistic libertine working for Beazle Bub. Or, or the fallen angels from uh, on high who have uh, gotten really pissed off at uh, the angels on high. And they have battles. I've seen the paintings. They're really astounding. Really a lot of good backlighting, too. Because there's a lot of backlighting in heaven. Uh, at least that heaven. Okay, what else? A New Mexico cops beat up a black college kid or students after mistaking their car for a drunken driver's. Well, you know, if they're black, they must have been doing something wrong. 65-year-old black grandmother. Now, I got to say, you know, I'm I'm 63 now. And a 65-year-old grandmother, black grandmother, was dragged out of a car by these cops. I guess she didn't comply fast enough. Well, I told you the story about the groundhog that didn't comply with the cops, so the cop shot it dead right on the freeway in front of everybody. I told that groundhog to move, and it didn't move, and then it started moving at me. And I got to tell you, it hulked up, and I don't know. It might have been a, a black groundhog. I think that's how he got away with it. He went back to the precinct and said, I think it was a Negro groundhog, and it just hulked up. I was really scared. And uh, the police union president said, okay, yeah, we'll go with that. We could we can use that in court. It'll work. 
Works in internal affairs every time. Yeah. Oh, Giuliani snaps back at uh, the former law firm for not consulting him before issuing, issuing the critical statement about him. Of course, he didn't notify them that he was going to implicate them in a bribery scandal and running slush funds through their law firm. You know, because really, the I got to tell you, these white shoe law firms usually don't have money laundering slush funds. Okay. I think that's usually in the domain of uh, the storefront uh, type of lawyers that Michael Cohen is. That's what I would think. And Rudy, what's up with Rudy? Well, we know what's up with Rudy. We've known what Rudy is since Rudy was considered America's mayor. Yeah, we know. And uh, I don't know. Oh, a biracial couple woke up to a lynch toy monkey and uh, racist get out comments spray painted on their house. You know, there is no more racism in America because we had a black president. And I used to say, hey. You can tell how racist America is because now we have a black president. Look at all these races coming out of the woodwork. It's just too much for him. Oh, my God. You mean I have to get along with people? No, I have a God-given right to be totally divisive and hate you. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's see. Oh, the Novartis CEO uh, apologizes to employees for hiring Trump fixer Cohen. Oh, we, you know, we just thought that the best way to uh, get on uh, Trump's good side is how we do it in other countries, and that's bribe the hell out of them. Okay, well, we could go on and on and on. We could mention about Kirsten Nielsen. Uh, she was close to resigning because uh, Trump berated her in front of other cabinet members because he thinks she's a Bush plant, a plant from the Bush family. You know, Trump really is a mobster. He's a thug. So, uh, you know, not, not that I, I, uh, am defending Kirsten Nielsen and her, I don't know, shall we say sanguine, uh, toadiness, but, uh, it just, uh, it just shows how Trump likes to, uh, put everybody on edge. Apparently it's a ritual, uh, a ritual with him to rip people apart in front of other people. He likes that. Gives him power. Yeah. He thinks that she's a Bush family plant. Well, probably is. All right. What are we going to be attending to today in the rest of the menu here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? A Michigan town is sued for barring non-Christians from living within its limits. Hey! We don't want any Jews, Krishnas, or uh, Janus living next door to me. They bring the property values down, don't you know? So, uh, Interior Secretary Zinke is busted lying at a Senate Appropriations Committee hearing about his political favor to Florida. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what they do. I'm lying. I didn't know I was lying. It's so hard to keep track of all my lies. I mean, this is a new job for me now. And... Paul Ryan says he's been for term limits since the day he got to Congress, 19 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> After the break, we then move to the chef's table where Trump's Treaty of Versailles precedent is a reminder that the last time America withdrew it from its own international security agreement, it led to the most devastating war in history. And... The Department of Homeland Security might hold its opinions in high regard, but it is not entitled to its own alternative facts. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
you go to the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com, you'll notice the chat room link over there on the right side of the page. And on the left side of the page are the contribute donate buttons. And those are important parts of our homepage indeed. So thank you for your generosity and uh, helping us keep the lights blinking in their proper order. We are unable to do that without you. So thank you very much. And uh, follow Netroos Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. We have a presence on Facebook, so go there too if you want. Otherwise, just uh, follow us on Twitter. That's always a good thing. You can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post a show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. So check those out. Uh, you'll get the full stories from the horse's mouth, as they say. And uh, what else? Oh, yes, of course. You can get West Coast Cookbook and Speak Easy podcast by way of TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. So let's, uh, we better hurry because I just, between the uh, top of the show here with uh, uh, Joy Reid and her panel uh, taking Democrats to task for for piling on I mean well caving first of all to the GOP who are bully bullies anyway but caving to them instead of standing up to them and uh, abandoning Nancy Pelosi uh yeah well we do need someone who has an institutional memory of how uh, government works please Oh, boy okay well like I said I better get on this because uh I went on and on and on at the top as well as uh, how long that clip was with Joy Reid's panel. This first article is by Noor Al-Sabai out of Raw Story. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is requiring a tiny Methodist-affiliated Michigan town to show documentation of their exemption from the Federal Fair Housing Act after a nearby inclusiveness group sued them for barring non-Christians from living within their city limits. Let's see. The friendly atheist reported uh, that the town of Bayview, Michigan, once required all of its residents to be both white and Christian. And although they dropped race from the charter in the 50s, they continue to only allow Christians to live there. (laughs) Oh, my God. See, the erosion of American ideals has been going on for a long time, like pretty much since our inception. (laughs) In 2017, uh, the Bayview Chattaqua Inclusiveness Group sued the privately owned Bayview Association of the United Methodist Church for alleged violations of the Constitution's Religious Freedom Clause, the Fair Housing Act, Michigan State Constitution, and other civil rights laws. They're trying to make the whole town into a condominium, so you're you're crazy like race laws and 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 things. We we have CC and ours, okay? I even in condominium CCNRs uh, uh, based upon race or religious affiliation are well. I, I think the term is called illegal. See, they argue that Bayview is not affiliated in any meaningful way with uh, the United Metho- Methodist Church. They operate independently from it. See, I have a religious right to be able to discriminate against people other than my religion. And I know the argument. Well, you wouldn't want a Muslim living right next door to a Hasidic Jew, would you? And I'm like, I don't know. We live in America. Why would that be bad? I mean, I've lived next to to uh, Holy Rollers, and I was okay. I mean, I, I, not so much now, but I used to get Jehovah Witnesses knocking on my door every Saturday morning. Did I go off on them? Well, maybe a little bit. We would put out the rabbit. We had a rabbit named Rabbi and a big Siamese cat that we named Buddha. And the cat was huge. I mean, it would sit up and it would look like a Buddha. That's why we named it Buddha, even from when it was a kitten. And uh, I would bring uh, Rabbi and Buddha out and say, well, uh, bow down to Rabbi and Buddha. And they look at me and think like, the kid is crazy. And they would leave. So I learned very early, if you're going to deal with uh, cults, just be a little bit more crazy than they are. And they're really afraid. Gotta go. So HUD uh, announced that the Bayview Association has not met its burden to prove it is exempt from the Federal Fair Housing Act. 
The Federal Housing Authority does not believe the town that boasted a population of 133 in the 2010 census is actually a private religious organization. Well, like I said, you can't use a religious organization as a, as a reason to discriminate. And you certainly can't make it as a condo CCNR. Zinke was caught lying in front of uh, the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee. Tommy Christopher from Shareblu Media penned this piece. Uh, he lied about why he exempted Florida from offshore drilling, and he got called out for it. It looks like Senator Chris Van Hollen forced him to admit the truth. And uh, Van Hollen was trying to secure the same treatment for his, his state that Florida got from the administration in January, an exemption from offshore oil and gas drilling. Uh, Florida has a moratorium in place, just a little different, Zinke said. Mr. Secretary, you know that that moratorium is not on the Atlantic coast. You know that that moratorium is on the Gulf Coast. Van Hollen had to interrupt him there. Uh, he had reminded, Van Hollen reminded the Secretary of his own prior testimony just days earlier than he, that he granted the exemption because Florida's entire delegation as well as its governor asked for it. Those conditions apply to Maryland, Van Hollen said, and and a moratorium which is off the coast of Florida, which would not allow the drilling of oil and gas, he said, off the Gulf Coast, not the Atlantic Coast. Okay. And uh, Zinke went on to say he would not grant Van Hollen's request, but that wasn't the point anyway. What? So Van Hollen was exp exposing the corrupt nature of Zinke's January announcement, which was later revealed to be part of a plot to boost the political chances of Governor Rick Scott, who is now running for the U.S. Senate. And the Florida exemption was the only one granted shortly after Trump opened up the entire Atlantic coast for drilling and had the convenient effect of protecting the ocean views of Trump's Mar-a-Lago club. Okay. All right. And Zinke has, of course, been involved in several of the roiling Trump cabinet scandals. But his treatment of natural treasures as political favors may be the worst of them all. Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Well, uh, this last article is by David Edwards out of Raw Story. Uh, Paul Ryan has spent nearly two decades in Congress and said that he supported term limits since the day I got here. Okay, well, during uh, the Speaker's Weekly press conference, a reporter asked, the longtime congressman, if he was in support of term limits for freshman lawmakers. I've always supported term limits, Ryan insisted. I've supported term limits since the day I got here. Nineteen years ago. <laughs> that was this reporter interjecting that little tidbit. Nineteen years ago. 
So I'm poor term limits, he says. Okay. Well, Ryan is retiring this year. Did not explain why he spent 19 years in the U.S. House of Representatives without limiting his service to fewer terms. Because it's always the ones who are the most adamant about term limits. Once they're there, it's always term limits for thee, but not for me. And uh, that's what the game was. They want term limits out because those damn constituents keep voting the same people in all the time. How terrible. How undemocratic. Okay, well, let's get to our break. And we'll come back and go through weather from around the world. And uh, finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, a boy, his horse, and a lot more. All the screen time that young Charlie Plummer didn't get as the kidnapped victim in All the Money in the World is more than made up for in Lean on Pete, where he's in almost every frame as 15-year-old Charlie, spelled differently from his real name, and whose life is being lived on the margins. His mother is run off, and his dad is basically a social services nightmare, functioning more as a delinquent older brother. One morning while out running near his Portland, Oregon home, Charlie comes across a seedy local racetrack and, needing money, takes a job working for trainer owner Dell, crustily played by Steve Buchemi, who quickly becomes a surrogate dad. Not that he's any good at it or even tries, but he fills a void, introducing Charlie to the hard side of life with the help of Dell's knocked around by life, literally, female jockey friend Bonnie, played by Chloe Savigny. Her advice to Charlie is to not get attached to the horses. That's ignored, of course, because attachment is exactly what he's seeking. Fearing for the picture's namesake, Lean on Pete, after Charlie learns the fate of horses who stop winning Fidel, he sets off on a multi-state journey with the animal to find his aunt in Wyoming. Director Andrew Hayes' first U.S. set picture, like his 45 years and weekend, is a study in contrast. Innocence versus growing up, the legendary glorious West versus the reality behind the myth of rugged individualism. An ever-present, if unseen, character in this seemingly not political picture is what we'd call the safety net. How is a child alone at the center of this desperation? With a touching script, nuanced direction, and breakout performance from Charlie Plummer, Willie Vlauten's novel, Lean on Pete, is in good, if not the happiest hands here. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60-Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. The sun exerts an enormous and obvious influence on the Earth, with its gravity and its light. But other bodies also have a small say in our affairs. We're not alone in the solar system, the other planets. Dennis Kent, a geologist at Rutgers University and Columbia's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And as we circle the sun, those other planets and also our moon exert uh, effects on our orbit. In fact, planetary scientists have long hypothesized that Venus and Jupiter squeeze the Earth's orbit from circular to elliptical and back every 405,000 years. During an elliptical orbit, when the distance from the Sun varies more, the differences between the seasons would be more extreme than when the orbit is virtually circular. Problem is, it's been hard to verify that this oscillation between orbit shapes exists. But Kent and his colleagues came up with a way, by boring down into the Earth. They took a rock core from the East Coast, which has excellent sediment records, good evidence of extreme seasonal variations. They compared that core with another from Arizona, embedded with zircons. The zircons contain trace amounts of uranium, which decays in a predictable way, meaning the Arizona core could thus be dated based on uranium content. Magnetic information in both cores allowed them to be lined up, and the Arizona dates then provided a timeline for the ancient floods and droughts embedded in the East Coast core. And all that evidence confirmed the mathematical simulations. Jupiter and Venus do push us around, and thus slowly alter our orbit over hundreds of millennia. 
The details are in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Kent says the discovery also provides a new way to interpret the history of life on our planet. It's a clock, and so being able to have a precise chronometer, we can relate things like speciation events or dispersals of various life forms, uh, allows us to uh, look at these things and try to understand what's driving them. As for whether modern-day humans need worry about this 405,000-year oscillation? This is uh, probably pretty low down the list of things to be concerned about, how much CO2 we put in the atmosphere. That, you know, that's, that's of a more immediate concern. Because despite our planetary neighbors' best efforts, our orbit has barely budged as we've observed our climate change. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Thursday, May 10th, 2018. I'm Seamary Ainsborough. The Trades Union Congress in the UK is planning a massive rally of working people and their supporters for Saturday, May 12th. According to the TUC, working people in the UK are fed up with government austerity, poor job prospects for young people, cuts to the National Health Service, and other vital issues. Here are some of the trade unionists who will be participating in the London rally. Millions of workers are being let down. The system just doesn't work for us. But our voices need to be heard. That's why May the 12th is an important day for working people across the country. Thousands of us will march across London to demand a new deal for working people. I'm marching for young workers. They need decent working conditions, so let's ban zero-hour contracts and raise the minimum wage. I'm marching for the hard-working public servants who deserve a pay rise, and for our NHS, which is at breaking point while this government stands idly by. I'm marching because regardless of race or background, everybody should be given the same opportunity at work and society. We must root out racism, sexism and homophobia at work. I'm marching because I see a lot of injustice and inequality. Years of cuts have led to poverty, homelessness and despair for many. This shouldn't be the case in modern day Britain. I'm marching because we have too many bosses sitting on piles of cash. If the government can provide tax breaks for big corporations and rich men, they can provide better conditions to the working people of Britain, the people who actually deserve it. We're the trade union movement. We stand up for millions of people across the UK. Together, we're demanding a new deal for working people. So join us on May the 12th. Frances O'Grady is the General Secretary of the British Trades Union Congress. She was interviewed on the Eyes to the Left podcast. What we're saying really is that it's time that we had a new deal for workers because people are put up with living standards falling, pensions being attacked, young people stuck on zero hours contracts, uh, minimum wage too low. Isn't it time that everybody had a decent pay rise and a decent job and that working people were listened to? It's about working people in all walks of life and the private sector as much as the public sector. You know, we've got a lot of manufacturing workers who are really worried about the future. People in the car industry seeing job cuts. People from Bombardier who fought a big campaign uh, to keep work there. People have been facing cuts to their public services. The NHS, you know, struggled through the winter. Hardworking, dedicated staff who are having to fight to get a decent pay rise, and I hope they'll get one. But not just the NHS, this is public services across the board. And it's no longer good enough uh, to tell people to be grateful for a job. I think people rightly want more than just a job. They want a good job you know, the kind of job that you can build a life on and bring a family up on. Um, So I think the conversations change. Of course, everybody wants to see more people in work and any increase in employment is good. But we've got to ask, what kind of work are people getting? And in some ways, the real problem in Britain now maybe is less about just unemployment, although that's bad enough if if you find it hard to to get work, but it's about this this new thing called underemployment. You know, when people get a contract, they might get a few hours, uh, they might get a couple of shifts, but they don't know where the next one is coming from. I mean, you know, how do you plan your money? Uh, how do you plan your childcare? 
how do you plan your life? You know, we know there are millions of people who are now stuck in this kind of zero hours, uh, false self-employment and agency work culture. And the problem is that, you know, again, the government will say, oh, well, that's a stepping stone to permanent work. Well, I'm afraid the evidence is quite the opposite. The evidence is you're stuck in this revolving door and it is hard to get out. So I think it's right that we should prioritise and say to young people, join us, because the only way in the end that you're going to get a better deal is by joining up to a union, sticking together and fighting for what you're due. More information about the rally can be found on the TUC website and on Twitter at hashtag New Deal. I'm Seamary Ainsborough. Thank you for listening. From United Nations headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Fargus with your World in Two Minutes. Three American prisoners held in North Korea have been returned to the United States. President Trump welcomed Kim Dong Chul, Tony Kim, and Kim Hak Sung back to the U.S. at a 3 a.m. ceremony on Wednesday just outside of Washington, D.C. Trump thanked Kim Jong Un for the gesture and said the North Korean leader was, quote, excellent to these three incredible people. Well, we're starting off on a new footing. This is a wonderful thing that he released the folks early. That was a big thing, very important to me. And I really think we have a very good chance of doing something very meaningful. Little is known for certain about how the American prisoners were treated in North Korea after they were found guilty of a range of crimes, including espionage. But speaking through a translator on the tarmac of Andrews Air Force Base, one said he was subjected to forced labor, though he also received occasional medical treatment. The Israeli military has once again struck targets within Syria with airstrikes overnight. The Israeli Defense Force, or IDF, said it targeted dozens of sites in southwestern Syria used by Iran's Quds Force, a division of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which had been launching rocket attacks on Israel. At least 20 rockets were launched towards the Israeli Golan Heights over the last 24 hours, but none reached their targets and no injuries have been reported. In a statement, the IDF said it will, quote, not allow the Iranian threat to establish itself in Syria. And there's a new claimant to the title of world's oldest elected leader. Mahathir Muhammad was sworn in as Malaysia's prime minister today at age 92. Muhammad's victory in Wednesday's elections upset incumbent Najib Razak, who was dogged in recent years by investigations into his alleged embezzlement of hundreds of millions of dollars from state accounts. Luke Fargus, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life, folks. That's a, yeah. Remember, remember French 77. Okay. The Saint Germain. That's the better uh, elderberry flower uh, or elderflower liqueur. Okay. Saint Germain. The most balanced cocktail in the history of cocktails. Not just my opinion. It's actually a well-known fact. Okay. <laughs> Starting off here at the chef's table, we'll begin with weather from around the world. And we always begin weather from around the world. Along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 51 degrees. Oh, my. Yes, we did get a little uh, uh, lower temperature last night. We went down to about 45 degrees. We're not going to be uh, uh, nearly as warm. Well, actually, we will be nearly as warm as we were yesterday, which was only about 71. Though tomorrow will be around 80, 82. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in the 80s over the weekend. So that's fine. 
relative humidity <clears throat> might be a little high, so it'll feel tropical. But we are known as the Banana Belt of Oregon. Check it out. Yeah. And uh, low chance of precipitation today, increasing a little bit tonight. And uh, looks like by Monday and definitely Tuesday, we'll have some thunder showers. Uh, extended thunder showers coming through that will last about three days. And uh, the weather is such that we should have thunderstorm activity squalls blowing through uh, with a little bit of electricity in the air. And it may drop some rain, but because of the wind, uh, it'll dry out. Right now, wind is out of the southwest at two miles per hour, increasing later on this morning uh, to to out of the north-northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. And then tonight, it'll shift once again out of the west, remaining at 5 to 10 miles per hour, which is uh, about what we are at this time of year. Dry conditions will continue because relative humidity is at 72%. Oh, my. Grass pollen is very high if that's, if that's hitting you. It's always the acacias when they come into bloom. That's usually when I get it. Uh, air quality index is good at 10 parts per million. I'll take that. Daytime uh, UV is down to 5, which is moderate. That's fine, but still, wear a hat. Wear sunscreen. And I don't know. I When I was a lifeguard and when I was a surfer, I always wore zinc oxide on my nose. Everybody called me a nerd. And now look at me. Yep, I'm an older nerd. Yeah. <laughs> at least I don't have any... Uh, well, melanomas, psychosomatic or otherwise, uh, appearing on the bridge of my nose. Lucky me. Okay, so weather from around the world. Oh, did I? Visibility is nine miles. Pressure, uh, we do have a bit of high pressure, and it is uh, rising at 30. Oh, I'm sorry. It's holding at 30.05 inches. Okay, so now that's out of the Rogue River Valley. And now, weather from around the world is brought to you by People's Personal Weather Stations that they purchase. These people planted these personal purchase weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Okay. Uh, the guy uh, just outside of London proper is registering 63 degrees and sunny. Paris is 71 and sunny. I keep saying how great Paris is in the spring every time I mention all week I've been mentioning Paris, all oh, spring in Paris, and I am not kidding. If you ever get a chance, go. And don't be afraid. They will they won't like hit you for not speaking French properly or speaking French at all. In fact, there'll be many of Parisian who want to try out their English on you. Okay, don't go there with preconceived notions and they won't be fulfilled. If you have a preconceived notion, it will be fulfilled. Okay, Rome is equally lovely in the spring, though at 74 degrees and partly cloudy, they still have uh, uh, rain and electrical storms that will uh, flood and knock out vital infrastructure. So, you know, if you can find an espresso that's pressed rather than on the electric side, you might be in luck. Kiev is 67 and fair. Kabul is 70 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 73 and fair. Never got a suit in Hong Kong or even from Hong Kong. One day I will. Uh, Tokyo is 61 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 54 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 52 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 65 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase. These people planted these personal purchase weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Hey, for 
first article here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spears Fridays is by Jeremy Surrey out of Foreign Policy Magazine. Donald Trump's unilateral withdrawal from the U.S. of the U.S. from the Seven Nation Agreement to halt Iranian nuclear production is a repudiation of traditional American diplomacy, but it also echoes an inauspicious American president in leaving the Iran deal. The United States is replaying its rejection of the Treaty of Versailles, a move that ultimately led to the most devastating war in history. The United States has been responsible for negotiating and enforcing some of the most endearing multinational diplomatic agreements in the 20th century, including the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, the United Nations Charter of 1945, the North Atlantic Treaty of 1949, and the Helsinki Final Act of 1975. Each of these agreements, hammered together by numerous countries with divergent interests, contributed to the peaceful, open international system that has benefited the United States and its allies by obliging all parties to adhere to long-term commitments pertaining to their security. Each of these agreements would have been impossible without U.S. support and adherence. More than any other nation, the United States has been the author and enforcer of the liberal world order that makes capitalism and democracy, as we know them, possible. But the Treaty of Versailles represents a dark blemish on this record. Building on President Theodore Roosevelt's pre-World War I proposal for a League of Peace, Woodrow Wilson led efforts to craft a multinational settlement at the end of the war that would ensure a lasting peace. The League of Nations was a centerpiece, centerpiece of the treaty, an international body inclusive of all nations that would adjudicate disputes between them, encourage cooperation, and punish aggression. The infamous redress the infamous rejection of the Treaty of Versailles by the U.S. Senate in November of 1919 and again in March 1920 destroyed this dream. Appealing to U.S. war fatigue, anti-British sentiment, and a distrust of complex diplomatic agreements, a mix of Republican and Democratic lawmakers used their opposition to the settlement to score partisan points especially for Republicans who challenged Wilson, it proved beneficial politically to stoke domestic fears of foreign entanglements. Walls of separation sounded sa safer than new cooperative connections with former belligerents. Of course, the opposite was true. American isolationism delegitimized the Treaty of Versailles. Why would other societies invest in the agreement if one of its leading proponents, also one of the emerging world powers, refused to participate? Many observers appreciated the domestic politics behind uh, the U.S. rejection of the, CD, of the treaty, but that only deepened long-standing perceptions that the United States was an unreliable partner. Gosh, this sounds so familiar. Uh, these conflict-prone circumstances hurt Americans, a non-member of the League of Nations. Without any other alliances, the U.S. was any, unable to exert international influence comparable to its size and wealth. Economic sanctions, popular with Herbert Hoover in response to Japanese expansion, were difficult to impose without coordination among these diverse states. International arbitration, reportedly promoted by the United States and China, was impossible to enforce when there was no international body of consistent implementation. And when the fascists invaded their neighbors, the countries defending the existing order, including the United States, negotiated in ad hoc and largely ineffective ways. Appeasement became the strategy of the lowest common denominator in a world with limited multilateral coordination. Now, Roosevelt, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, recognized the U.S. short-sighted unilateralism, unilateralism contributed uh, to an even worse World War II. 
And uh, so it was uh, when we enter the conflict, he emphasized multilateral commitments through his advocacy of the expansive four freedoms agenda and his signature on the Atlantic Charter in 1941. So uh, the United Nations, Bretton Woods, NATO, and the Helsinki Act, through those, Washington multiplied its sources of political, military, and economic power to to deter and defeat communist adversaries. The U.S. cultivated more national strength and international support than ever before. It was the most responsible, powerful actor in the Cold War. Well... After Trump's rejection of the Iran deal, the world again, as after Versailles, has caused to wonder whether the United States will adhere to other strategic agreements, including NATO, that it has designed and itself promoted. Sous l'été, les pieds nus dans le sable Danser maintenant Et jeter vos ennuis dans les vagues Qui dansent Okay, Andrew Boyle from Just Security has penned this last piece here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The DHS came out with a press release late last week proclaiming that the number of illegal border crossers at the southwest border had more than tripled in April of 2018 in comparison to April 2017. For the second month in a row, according to DHS, we have seen more than 50,000 individuals try to illegally enter the United States. States. Now, despite the DH's breathless claims to the contrary, the numbers don't demonstrate a continuing security crisis along our southwest border. Rather, the department's blatant misrepresentation of newly released custom and border protection data is typical of the agency's efforts to remake data in support of the Trump administration's anti-immigrant agenda. It follows the bad example set by the misleading and inaccurate January 2018 report issued by DHS and the Department of Justice, which cherry-picked information to find ways to blame foreign nationals and foreign-born Americans, especially Muslims, for all terrorism in the U.S., and which has prompted the Brennan Center and others to file a lawsuit under the Data Quality Act. Now, a fundamental problem with the DHS's security crisis claims is that they conflate apprehensions with the number of people actually crossing the border illegally. Now, granted, apprehensions could be used as a loose comparative metric of illegal border crossings of all other major variables that might affect the number stayed the same over time, but things have changed. For example... Denied funding for his wall, Trump in April authorized funding for hundreds of National Guard troops who were deployed to the border to assist immigration enforcement through the use of drones, helicopters, and other monitoring capacities. Moreover, the CBP itself has been increasingly aggressive in enforcement. In fact, given the significant addition of resources and effort, it would be surprising if there wasn't an increase in apprehensions. Uh, Finally, the context regarding the tripling of numbers between April of 2017 and April of 2018 that the DHS fails to mention is critical. The April 2017 numbers were not only the lowest for any month of 2017 and not only the lowest of any April in at least the last six years, but the lowest number of any month for at least the last six years, making the comparison an outlier at best. All this is to say that these numbers do not support an assertion of an enlarging crisis despite the department's attempt to manufacture one. Fear-mongering over immigration is obviously not new for this administration, nor is the use of alternative facts. But illegal border crossings are important topics with often serious consequences for both U.S. citizens and non citizens alike, and they are topics worthy of fact-based sober debate. Now, if your policies depend on distortion to be justified, then they probably aren't worth policies worth keeping now, aren't they? Indeed. All right. 
brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. So stay tuned to Networks Radio, and we will visit with you on Monday in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ba-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-